Good afternoon and welcome to Matters Financial and Geopolitical from a Frontier. And thank you for stopping by as always. Let me start with some macro thoughts and the US-China trade deal phase one. Chi Girl tweeted economic and trade agreement between the United States of America and the People's Republic of China, the full document, if that's what you want to look at. Um, v Patel FX initially said, tweeted, looks like initial reaction to US-China trade deal is not great, judging by the dollar block G10 FX. And at that point, the Kiwi and Aussie was selling off, uh, as you can see from his uh, image that he tweeted. Classic buy the rumors, sell the fact reaction. Details will be interesting, but hard to see it changing FX outlook. And I sort of responded because I saw that come across the feed. I would take the other side. Um, and at that point, the Aussie was at 0.6881 and the Kiwi at 0.6591. Um, Aussie is now 0.6905, Kiwi is 0.6634. And I said, I reckon the market is too pessimistic. I think the market is too negative at that moment. And I still think uh, there's quite a bit of negativity. And uh, I said, this is an entente cordiale and suits both sides at this time. And I actually. Um, was uh, being interviewed by CCTV and Raman Yang, and it was a four-way Beijing, Nairobi, London, Washington. And uh, for a whole hour, we had to listen to President Trump uh, thank everyone in the room. And both sides, I think, have too much invested in this phase one deal now. 23rd of December, I said the crossfire of a trade war now ebbing well for a few months because Trump has an election to win and Xi has an, S it has an economy to rescue. And uh, uh, I said I expect a detente ahead of the election and phase one deal signals as much. Now, let's get into some details. China has pledged to buy almost $95 billion worth of US commodities as part of the Space One trade deal. Um, the text of the pact released specifies $77.7 billion in additional Chinese purchases of manufactured goods, including aircraft, $32 billion in new purchases of agricultural projects and 52.4 billion in energy and 37.9 billion in services in the two years through December 2021. And I think that is, you know, there's skepticism about this too, but we've had a crossfire, we've had a lot of aggressive language, and but I think this is doable in point of fact, and I think the market will come around to realizing that, and I think a lot of it will be driven by energy. I know there's some tariffs on energy, but I think those will be lifted if the Chinese write a big check. Uh, T commodity as uh, looking at the uh, dollar renminbi uh, currently just below 689. Um, <clears throat> and uh, he says, um, He's a little bit bearish. He thinks it's a bull flag, as does Chi Girl, by the way. Uh, Joseph Trevisani, the PBOC, continues to revalue the renminbi higher against the dollar as the US-China trade deal reorders the pair. The renminbi is up 4.15% since September 4. As I've previously said, this is the signal in the noise. This is the most important currency to watch right now. And when I was talking to Rama, um, who's very erudite and fast-paced, um, I said it is the key signal. Now, the irony of this all is that, you know, I, they were called a currency manipulator. And now there's, they're, they're not being called one, but they actually manipulate this currency and they're going to manipulate it higher, in my view. And we could rally as far as 625 if this detente entente cordiale uh, gains more traction. Um, however, if it was a free market, it would be trading around about 8. 
Hugh, who I follow and follows me, never thought the signing ceremony could last for such a long time, almost long enough for fighting another trade war. And it did, and I was sitting there in the studio for a whole hour as President Trump thanked just about everybody. So overall, I'm going to row against the market. The market believes it has a tremendous amount of skepticism. I think that you know this is a phase one. It is linear. There is more to be done, clearly. But I think there are commitments here which will be uh, held to. And I think it suits both sides now to tone things down, Trump to win his election, get keep the economy humming. Xi, uh, it has caused damage to the Chinese economy and he probably wants to underpin the Chinese economy because that is, in fact, the entire raison d'etre of the Chinese CCP party. I found this very interesting, Hal's Rethink, an important thread with extreme compactness captures the late state of play for central bankers before they are swept aside by a great crash and takeover by governments of ownership of everything total socialism. And he is referencing a tweet from Italians for Brexit. AEP, Keynesians, Monetarists, Austrians, Wixellians on the causes of the Great Recession and the low growth malaise that has followed. And Bernard Connolly's new book, it's well worth tapping on those two links and having a look because it's also very valid critique of where we are today. <clears throat> Home thoughts, looking out on the ocean front at Recife, contemplating Africa on the other side of the Atlantic, Howard French, um, uh, the root of slaves that linked these two parts of the world for so long. Howard is visiting Brazil and has been tweeting some excellent photographs of very, very interesting uh, it makes me definitely want to visit. Howard was my guest last year at Mindspeak for a real mind bender of a Mindspeak. We were focused more on Africa and China. Um, the presentation is there in full and also the Q&A session, which was a very interesting interaction as well. If you've got time, do watch both. This is Olinda. Um, a, a, another photograph. This is Couldn't Help It um, and you will of course know this is probably the most photographed uh, thing in Brazil. Political reflections, Russia to get new Prime Minister after government resigns, DW News. Little known head of Russia's tax service, Mikhail Mishutin, was named as the next Prime Minister of Russia hours after Dmitry Medvedev resigned on Wednesday, capping a day of unexpected changes to Russian politics. Uh, President Putin had a working meeting with Mikhail Mishutin and suggested he take on the duties of the head of the government, the Kremlin press service said. With his consent, Putin submitted the prime ministerial candidacy of Mishustin to be considered in the Duma. Not everything worked out, but everything never works out, Putin said. Opposition politician and former economy minister Andrei Nechayev told DW that Putin was sounding out the terrain in order to stay in power forever. Um, uh, a. Uh, Polyakova, here's Putin's opening move for staying in power past 2024, changing the constitution which has always been the most straightforward path of least resistance. I've written severally about Putin, uh, 5th of December 2016, I wrote an article called The Parabolic Rebound of Vladimir Putin. Um, uh, v. Uh, Chakarova asks, who's going to stay longer in power, Xi or Putin? My response is Putin without question. 
uh, Gary Kasparov, stop asking about the new dance Putin's Kremlin puppet show is performing. His intent is to be dictator for life was clear over a decade ago and the only way he'll leave power is in a box, just like his idol Stalin. Um, there is a super documentary on DW News documentary called The Rise of Vladimir Putin Extended Cut and if you've got an interest in the man, a lot is disclosed in that. Then in October 2015, on the occasion of Putin's intervention in Syria, I wrote an article, Putin is a geopolitical grandmaster. Uh, that's worth looking at at the same time. Now, very dramatic developments. Lev, Lev Parnas on the Ukraine scandal. President Trump knew exactly what was going on, he tells Maddow. Now, I know we've got a political uh, situation in the Senate. This will surely cut on party lines, but nevertheless, the facts speak for themselves. 4th of November last year, I was quoting William Golding at the moment of vision, the eye see nothing. I was talking about the police verso or the verso police, which is a Latin phrase meaning with a turned thumb that is used in the context of gladiatorial combat. And I said the Republican Party will be making a very hard-nosed political calculation. And then I was predicting that, you know, Vice President Pence, who also seems to be caught up in this Lev Pana story, um, I said he's an evangelical Christian and is the habit of praying with another evangelical Christian and Nobel Prize winner far away in Addis Ababa. Don't ask me how I know that, but I do. Is the coming man, and this could happen real quick, and I think that's say an outcome that should not be ruled out. Independence is not an option, China tells Taiwan, according to the Times. Beijing set the stage for bitter confrontation with Taiwan this morning by insisting that the island would always remain part of China, despite the newly re-elected president saying it was already independent. Uh, Mia Ziaguang of China's Taiwan Affairs Office said it's a dead end for anyone who wants to do Taiwan independence. We have the firm will, sufficient confidence and ample capabilities to thwart plots of Taiwan independence in any form. Uh, Shai Ing-wen was returned as president on Sunday in a landslide victory. She said, we don't have a need to declare ourselves an independent state. We are an independent country already, and we call ourselves the Republic of China, Taiwan. Beijing insists that it must unify with Taiwan by force if necessary. Um, the local election in Taiwan does not alter the fact that Taiwan is Part of China, no matter what the outcome is, our Taiwan policy remains unchanged. Um, Hu Xin has sought to dampen the enthusiasm by arguing that Beijing is not ready to have a military showdown with Washington, which has a security pact with Taiwan. Xi, President Xi said invading Taiwan is something that is going to be very costly for China. Of course, President Xi has said many times on the occasion of the Communist Party turning 70, complete reunification of the motherland, he said, is an inevitable trend. No one and no force can ever stop it. Uh, he also said China reserves the right to use force against any intervention by external forces. Worth, if you're interested in the military side, and uh, it's worth reading an article in the Asia Times, War in the Taiwan Strait is not unthinkable. 25th of November, I was writing about Iran, as I've done several times, and then in that article I said, this alliance of Secretary Pompeo, the MAGA tweet army, because Twitter's blocked in Iran, Mariam Rajavi and the MEK is just not credible. I said it's incredible. We've got to add into that mix the son of the Shah, Pallavi Reza, 
who was uh, at the Hudson Institute, where he said about the protests, I think the people smell an opportunity for the first time in 40 years, he says. Um, uh, but I don't think he is credible at all, though Rajavi tweeted, the whole issue is that the Veliat e Faki regime is on its last leg. This alliance of Pompeo, the MAGA tweet army, Mariam Rajavi and the MEK. Um, of course, maximum pressure has put enormous pressure on the regime. And I'm sure um, that President Trump, uh, with his decapitation strike, thought that would tip them over the edge. And C.S. Sticky writing in the Daily Beast, when it comes to the art of deal-making in Middle East statecraft, death is part of the bargain. At least since the days of the Crusades, assassinations have been used as negotiating tools. Trump apparently saw the decision to liquidate Iranian General Qasem Soleimani as a natural negotiating ploy. Perhaps his hawkish advisers told him without some important caveats. It's the kind of thing the Israelis have been doing for years. That would explain in part Trump's tweet on Monday that simply dismissed the debate of whether Soleimani was plotting an imminent attack on U.S. installations or personnel. Trump continued to insist without presenting evidence that he believes that to have been the case with Soleimani, then added, doesn't really matter because of his horrible past. My article addressing that issue was on the 6th of January called The Assassination. Let's move on to international markets. Uh, the dollar's selling off a little bit here. Euro dollar 111.57, dollar index 97.22, Japanese yen at 110, the figure, Swiss franc 0 0.9679, the pound uh, 130.58, the Australian dollar 0.6915, India rupee 70.855. South Korean won 115587, the Rial 41293, the Egyptian pound, which has had a storming run this year, 15.88, and the Rand at 14.3886. Dollar index, I'm expecting more weakness towards 9450. I think the liquidity bomb that's been dropped by the Fed, half a trillion dollars in September is what's going to lead us a little bit lower. Notwithstanding, on the other side, we've got huge borrowings globally in the dollar. JP Morgan, about the euro dollar, still persistent sell-off risk. I'm not sure I agree, actually. I can see the euro rallying a bit here, up to 114.50. We're currently at 111.58. Gold, um, as I wrote over the weekend, I think conditions are supportive for gold this year. We're at 1555.70, um, high this year, 1600 on that spike. Um, but uh, for now, I think we'll stay around here. Crude oil, I'm bullish. I know a lot of folks are, are bearish on this. I think we're at the channel lows. I think we're overdue a bounce. I think China's going to use this opportunity to cut a side deal with Trump and say, look, we'll take a whole lot on, just remove the tariffs, and that will be done. Um, so we're currently at $58.38. I can see us getting back to sixty fifty without much trouble. Tallo Oil is to book a $1.5 billion write down on the oil price outlook and reserves. Um, they've written down after cutting long term oil price assumptions by $10 to $65 a barrel. Reduction in oil price assumptions brings Tallo more in line with peers' expectations. Tallo said the write offs include Jethro, Joe, Carapa, Wellcost in Guyana as a result of drilling results, and Kenya Block 12A, Mauritania C3, PEL7, Namibia, and Jamaica license costs due to the levels of planned future activity or license exits. Listen to this, a final investment decision for Kenya is still penciled in for the end of this year, but that target is challenging. COO Mark McFarlane said. Tallo Oil is down 74.4% uh, yet over 12 months. It's really crashed and burned. And they've also announced stopping trucking the oil from Turkana, which was always a PR gimmick anyway. 
Emerging markets Brazilian indigenous tribes began a four-day gathering in the Amazon to plan their resistance to President Jair Bolsonaro's push to open their reservations to commercial mining and agriculture. The bulk of EM has failed to outgrow advanced economies since 2013. Examples are Mexico and South Africa, where 2019 growth is zero. This is Robin Brooks' IIF. Weak growth rates raise risk of short-termism and policy mistakes. You can say that again. Howard, who's been in Brazil, I went to a fantastic multi-stage, multi-act, live music extravaganza featuring Soy Jorge last night. Last full day in Rio today, and there is a pre-carnival festival on Copacabana that's expected to draw 400,000 people. He obviously enjoyed himself on the beach. Beirut is an unusual place. Ads now target rioters, tweeted Nassim Taleb. That took me back to uh, some of the photographs that came out of Beirut, the very electro-funk um, techno music that was associated with that revolution. And of course, you know that song that I really like from Ronnie Saikali. Most of Lebanon's longer bonds trade at less than 50 cents, implying a high chance of default. That's via Paul Wallace. 21st of October, I wrote about the new economy of anger. I said, this is a revolution. It's a global phenomenon. I quoted Kapuczynski, if the crowd disperses, goes home, does not reassemble, we say the revolution is over. And I said, it's not over. More and more people are gathering in the streets. Um, uh, Sergei Lanau, Lanau of IIF, we've developed a scorecard of risk of social stress in emerging markets, stepping away from classic macro indicators. LATAM and South Africa look the most vulnerable as do Turkey and Saudi in relative terms, CEE genuinely looks better. Sub-Saharan Africa, the Royal Museum for Central Africa, one of the largest museums anywhere devoted exclusively to Africa. It is thousands of miles from the continent itself, the tall windows, pillared facade, rooftop balustrade, 90-foot high rotunda, of the main building give it the look of a chateau. That impression is only enhanced by an inner courtyard and a surrounding park, formal French gardens, a reflecting pool and fountain, ponds with ducks and geese, wide lawns laced with hedges and carefully groomed paths that sweep away to majestic trees in the distance. More than 90% of sub-Saharan African items housed in museums, for example, are held outside that continent. This is the Elgin Marbles controversy writ large. Should art or cultural objects taken from somewhere else be returned to the territories they came from? Even if that makes moral sense, it doesn't always work out. The Royal Museum for Central Africa, in fact, gave a small portion of its magnificent African art collection to a museum in the DR Congo some 40 years ago. But the country's long-term dictator at that time, Mobutu Sese Seko, was famously kleptocratic. And within a few years, many of these same objects began appearing for sale in Europe, some in the shops of Brussels antique dealers. Ethiopia Telecom first half revenue rose a whopping 32% to approximately $69 million and subscriber base of 50.4 million. Company expects full year sales of 45.4 billion beer, approximately $1.43 billion. You can understand why people are getting excited about getting invested in there. And I wrote about this in July 2018, Ethiopia Rising, and I said the Prime Minister needs to execute real quick on the economic front. But if he levels the playing field, a whole troop of folks will be looking to pile in. Just another ordinary day in the life of Zimbabweans, Manangagwa going across the mountains to Mozambique, that's from Ali Naka. 
As I said previously on the occasion of Mugabe's death, Manangagwa, who was eulogizing Mugabe as a revolutionary icon, has failed and is frankly as untenable as his erstwhile mentor. Zimbabwe signed a currency swap deal with China. This is VOA News. Joined Japan, South Africa, and Nigeria in signing a currency swap deal with China, which it hopes will improve trade between the two countries. We have entered into a currency swap arrangement. What this means is there are those who would be investing in Zimbabwe from China and those who require their proceeds to be remitted back to China, which is normal. Hawkins says Harare must address its economic crisis and stop fiddling around the edges of the problem rather than tackling the problem. He's correct. I take you back to Yuval Harare. Money is the most universal and most efficient system of mutual trust ever devised. Cowrie shells and dollars, which is what the Zimbabwean currency is, have only value in our common imagination. Their worth is not inherent in the chemical structure of the shells and paper, or their color, or their shape. In other words, money isn't a material reality, it's a psychological construct. It works by converting matter into mind. And what I'm saying is it's not able to do that in Zimbabwe. Apau pour parler du Sahel des Doyennes ou West African agas par le petit frère Macron, says Le Monde. Um, and I take you back to Salif Keita, who released a video on Facebook telling President Ibrahim Boubacar Keita to stop subjecting yourself to little Emmanuel Macron. He's just a kid. Um, Mozambique's new sea starts anew as terror threatens LNG boom. Uh, sworn in for a second term Wednesday, three months after his landslide victory. Peace is our absolute priority. We will defend peace even if it costs our lives, he said. Mozambique is on the cusp of a massive natural gas-led boom. We asked our compatriots for some patience in managing expectations because the state coffers will take some time to reap gas dividends, Newsy said. We want to prove that energy resources can be a blessing and not a curse. He's facing an insurgency where 850 people have died since the first attacks in October 2017 and where Putin's buddy has had to go and rethink things as well after taking a beating. Corruption, that's the tuna bomb scandal. Um, uh, he signed a peace accord with the Renamo, and then not to be discounted is climate change. I mean, they've had consecutive tropical cyclones, um, and the world's six poorest countries are among the most vulnerable to climate change. 4th of June 2012, I wrote an article in Maputo Boomtown, then I went to the Africa Rising Conference, then we had went from boom to bust. And now we're going to boom again. South African all share up 1.72% so far this year. Deviations of our valuation model from the US Treasury's FX report. Big South African rand overvaluation, says Robin Brooks. Interesting. Dollar rand 14.3886. Egyptian pound 15.88. EGX 30 down 1.37%. Nigerian all share, best in the world, up 8.27% so far this year. Ghana Stock Exchange down 0.58% so far this year. Kenyans can expect a more austere government after years of unbridled borrowing that financed conspicuous consumption, Treasury Secretary Yatani. Um, targeting to contain expenditure below 23% of GDP in the next three years from 27.8% and intends to collect revenue equivalent to 20% of its output. Uh, days of conspicuous consumption are long gone. We're going to cut our cloth according to our size. He's talking the talk. He's got to walk it now. Yatani was confirmed as head of treasury. Uh, future budgets will not automatically increase from the previous years and Treasury will critically review every financing need uh, soon to publish the debt strategy. Government is not only paying attention to the development of debt levels but keenly examining the size and nature of public debt with a view to considering debt reprofiling. 
cut growth from 6.1% to 5.6%, I think it's more likely to be 3 um, Treasury faces hurdles in getting bank funding business daily. Moody said in its 2020 outlook on Africa, Treasuries, that the borrowing costs will go up should the government fail to reduce its fiscal deficit. Commercial banks hold 1.57 trillion worth of government debt, equivalent to 54.06% of the state's total domestic debt. That stands at 2.9 trillion. Domestic banks' capacity and willingness to purchase government securities influence the liquidity conditions sovereigns face, particularly those with constrained or unreliable access to external financing. Current fiscal year, Kenya's fiscal deficit stands at 640.2 billion, looking for a total of 305.7 billion in domestic borrowing. ICA Lion said in its outlook they anticipate yields on government securities will go up by between 100 and 150 basis points this year. Since the repeal of the rate cap, interest rates on Treasury bills and Treasury bonds have risen by almost one percentage point in some instances, said the firm's head of research. I wrote about this on the 23rd of December. I said Kenyan lenders are the second most exposed to the government with almost 300% of their equity lent out to the government. What this tells me is that an important source of buy-side demand for the government of Kenya shilling paper is now limit long. If you're sitting on the credit committee of a Kenyan bank and exercising some degree of oversight, I would argue that then you would be demanding a hard cap Therefore, given the fact that GOK issuance is not going to slow down but will probably accelerate, I would be keeping a close eye on the curve. Staying ahead of the curve was a remarkable book by the renowned investor George Soros. It's worth reading. I'm expecting a parallel shift higher, a little bit like ICA line. Private sector growth accelerated to 7.3% in November. Uh, Nairobi all shares up 0.58%, NSE 20 is up 0.66% year to date. And with that, I take my leave. Thank you.